Well, welcome everybody. This is the Brave New World of Tomorrow's panel. Um, the name of this panel came about because it was just about a year ago today, uh, I was sitting in a uh, convention center hall room uh, with several of these people in San Diego doing the World of Tomorrow's panel to celebrate our 25th anniversary. And my, what a lot of things have changed in a year. Um, we're gonna get into some of that and some of the challenges Tomorrow's is facing in light of the pandemic and some of the things, how some things are never gonna change first and stay the same. So um, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, first, we have Mr. Mike Manley, a very uh, well-known and highly respected comic book and comic strip artist. He's also been the editor of Draw Magazine since what, Mike, 2001, did we start Draw? To between 2000 and 2001, some of them, yeah, yeah. Yep. Long yep. time ago, so far ago we can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Um, next up, we have Mr. Keith Dallas. Um, in, uh, in addition to being the uh, overall series book editor of our American Comic Book Chronicles series, uh, Keith has also written or co-written several books for us, uh, The Flash Companion and uh, more recently, Comic Book Implosion, which uh, was nominated for an Eisner Award. Uh, Keith, good to see you. You look Yeah, great well. to see you guys. I yeah. you know, hope everyone's well. Indeed. indeed. Definitely uh, depressed that we don't get to meet in San Diego, but... We just got to roll with it. There you go. So uh, next up is a longtime friend of mine from the very early days of when I started the Jack Kirby Collector. This guy jumped on board very early on and was basically um, um, invaluable to getting that publication moving, as well as getting to Mars moving. Uh, John B. Cook is the current uh, editor of Comic Book Creator Magazine, and of course, everybody remembers him from Comic Book Artists, it's, it's Precursor. Um, he's also the uh, author of a really wonderful Eisner Award nominated book called The Book of Weirdo, published by Last Gasp, not by Tomorrow's, but it is up for an Eisner Award this year. John, take a bow. Hi, <laughs> Joe. He's smiling very well, nicely. And then uh, final, our final panelist is a uh, close associate of mine. He's been our production assistant, our shipping manager, and the editor of the Modern Masters book series line, uh, which we started, wow, Eric, what year was that? 2003, maybe? Somewhere in there? 2003 is when the first one came out. Yeah. Um, yeah, started in 2002, but it came out in 2003. Oh, there you go. Well, this is Mr. Eric Nolan Weathington. So um, uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about, like I said, about all the challenges we're facing. I'm going to get the ball rolling. Um, Back mid-May, like everybody else, we were hit with this whole worldwide pandemic, and we got news that Diamond Comic Distributors was closing down, uh, hopefully temporarily at that point, but um, they were not accepting any new shipments whatsoever, and we had, let's see, we had six magazines, and our 25th anniversary book were on the way in transit from our printer overseas, uh, so, but they announced that they were not accepting any new um, deliveries there in their warehouses, so we were kind of stuck in limbo, what are we going to do here? Well, we worked it out with Diamond so they would receive the books, but they weren't going to send them to stores because in the first place, most of the stores were closed at that point. But also Diamond did not have the staff in hand to, to even handle processing all those, all those publications, let alone all the other ones they normally handle. So, um, so we had six magazines and a book stuck in limbo. Also, uh, we had a situation with the bookstore market, Barnes & Noble, Books a Million, things like that. Um, we have a different distributor we work with for that. Uh, likewise, our books were in transit to them, for the new issues of Retrofan and Brick Journal Magazine, and we got the word that they're not accepting anything, and if we do deliver anything, they're not only going to not accept it, they're going to bill us to destroy all the copies and uh, charge us as if we had sent them to Barnes & Noble stores and Barnes & Noble sold zero copies and returned them all, uh, which was a very unfortunate situation for us. We were left, well, the only choice we had left was to reroute the shipments to be destroyed. Um, so, uh, it was way too many copies for us to ever possibly sell on our own. You know, we do keep a certain amount in our own warehouses for subscribers and for selling through our website, but we couldn't possibly absorb all those copies without Barnes and Noble's bookstore chain to handle it. So unfortunately we, we had to basically just trash thousands of copies of Retrofan and Brick Journal that we'd already paid to print and ship from overseas. Um, and so we not only lost on the production costs and the shipping on that, but any possible future income from those. At the same time, that bookstore distributor has now, uh, for all intents and purposes, gone out of business. So we're without a bookstore distributor. We're, we are uh, currently um, dealing with a, a new, much smaller bookstore distributor who hopefully will get uh, those magazines back in Barnes & Nobles and other retail chain stores soon. But um, it's going to be much lower quantities. It's probably going to be a lot harder to find the books there. So. Um, that's, that's another one of the challenges we're facing right now at tomorrow. So what, what do we do? I was left with the thing, okay, we don't, we don't know what Diamond's going to do. 
We don't know what books, what comic book stores are going to do. We don't know what Barnes and Noble is going to do if they're going to reopen. Um, there had been talk that they would just basically keep them all closed and never reopen. Um, so I decided, uh, made the executive decision, kind of take matters into our own hands, kind of, uh, you know, follow our own destiny here, and started a campaign. Um, uh, partially at the suggestion of Mr. Cook, there he said, "Why don't you offer half year subscriptions to people?" Uh, because a lot of people were out of work, their income was limited, but uh, maybe they couldn't afford to subscribe for a full year directly from us, but a half year, that, that would be a little more palatable for them. I kind of took the ball with that and ran, um, and we started a campaign to try and convince people to go ahead and subscribe for the short term, for just a half a year, to get us through this whole pandemic crunch, and that way we're kind of not beholden to whether or not Diamond reopens, uh, whether or not all the comic shops reopen, what happens with bookstore distribution, things like that. So. That, in addition to a just a wealth of wonderful tomorrow's readers who have uh, come to our come to our rescue and been ordering through our web store, ordering back issues and books and things, um, just has is really what's kept us afloat because uh, we have this long production lag, which is um, from the time we send something to our overseas printer, it's 60 days until the publication is back here, barring any shipping delays. And then it's another 30 before Diamond or our other distributors will, will pay us for those. So uh, with that long lag, uh, add to that the fact that we basically had to shut down production for about two and a half, three months. Uh, we're talking six months in there without any income coming in. Uh, that's, that really hit us hard. And thankfully, our customers have, have, have uh, come to the rescue here and, and ordered a lot of stuff off our, off our website. We had a big, we're having a big 40% off sale on magazines. And uh, but they've been ordering books, subscribing, um, really, really, really coming to the fore to help us stay in business. And you know, we just cannot cannot thank our customers enough for that. Uh, I also cannot thank these gentlemen here with me right now um, for for hanging in there as well. You know, I had to basically call them all up and say, hey, guess what? We're uh, shutting down temporarily, at least. You know, stop production on your publications. I know you're in the middle of a lot of things, um, but we're gonna to have to just basically put everything on hold until we know what the distributors are doing. But now I wanted to kind of turn it over to our panelists and have a little discussion here about um, some, of the, some of the challenges these guys are facing, both in their personal lives and in their production lives in terms of uh, you know, creating the books and magazines that uh, all readers love uh, so much. And um, I think I'd like to first start with John Cook. John's probably been with us, I believe, the longest of anybody on this crew. Uh, going back to the early days uh, when we launched Comic Book Artist and he won, won, won multiple Eisner Awards and lots of uh, critical acclaim for Tomorrow's out of the deal. Uh, John, you know, you, you depend a lot on very close personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews with the creators you cover. I know, for instance, you just did, uh, your new issue just went to the printer with your uh, interview with Wendy Peeney. And you actually went there and interviewed her you know, face to face in person for hours and hours. Um, how is what's going on right now in the world? How's it going to affect what you're doing going forward? And what, what are your plans going forward for CBC? Well, I mean, thank God for Skype. Uh, you know, um, I did a great, uh, I don't know, probably four hours with uh, Tim Truman, uh, who's uh, Timothy Truman, who's the next the subject of the issue that's following this. Um, o over Skype or Zoom or in person? It's over Skype. Oh yeah, no, you know, in, in person is out of the question right now. Um, I just, uh, so, and that was very revealing because that was right in the very beginning of the uh, pandemic. So that kind of, you know, got involved. I mean, that was a part of the conversation. You know, he does a dystopian uh, story scout uh, taking place in a, uh, horrific landscape of America. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, so he, uh, it was, it was uh, very, very interesting and very revealing. Uh, the interviews in uh, Comic Book Creator have been kind of getting deeper and deeper. And uh, it's interesting. I, I, I guess I, maybe I bring myself more in, or my experience more into it. So especially with Wendy Penny, it was, uh, it was a remarkable interview of we're talking about her dysfunctional childhood. And, uh, just very interesting, fascinating where she came from. And I think she's an absolute fascinating person and being self-invented. Well, know. but she's also so forthcoming in that interview. I mean, she doesn't hold anything back. She just kind of like it, decided very early on that, okay, I'll answer all your questions. And it's like she wasn't expecting them. You know, hmm. 
but we got we got in pretty deep, and it was uh, wonderful. It was a very uh, it was a very uh, uh, cl a moment of clarity, I guess, you know, for her. It was, she, it was very good, and she's very very excited about the issue. And thank God it's going to press. And uh, so then we got Tim Truman coming next time. Uh, he's got a uh, mini series that's going to be coming out. Uh, Scout Marauder. Um, he was a wonderful interview. He comes from the uh, the wilds of West Virginia and uh, Pennsylvania and the coal country. Um, and uh, 25 is going to be pretty darned important, I think. Uh, it's Barry Windsor Smith. Uh, I had the opportunity, I've been a friend of Barry's for a long time. Um, I finally got him to go on the record. Uh, it took a long time to do it, and it's on the occasion of him coming out with this uh, massive graphic novel, Monsters, which is uh, 350 pages or 360 page graphic novel that. I scanned every single page, and I'm telling you, it's the most remarkable work he's ever done. It is gorgeous, just wonderfully drawn. Um, and the story is very dramatic. It started off as originally as a Hulk adventure. And um, I just last night uh, got the attention of uh, Terry Dodson, and so he'll be uh, issue 26. I've always loved Terry's work, uh, and him and his their husband and wife team. Uh, him and Rachel, uh, and he's very enthusiastic. So he's going to be doing a new cover for us, and uh, I'm thrilled at that. So I'm moving ahead. I'm not. I haven't started production on um, on the uh, Tim Truman issue yet. I'm um, just out of practicality reasons. Uh, thank God for the unemployment situation of, of making making some money uh, from uh, uh, the uh, what is it called? It's some program that the government stimulus. Has. This, well, it's not stimulus, but yeah, it's what it's government money, right? So <laughs> that's that's been good as keeping afloat. I'm concerned about July. At the end of July, we'll see where it is. Uh, I don't want to receive one penny from tomorrow's until after that, um, and then I want to receive a lot of pennies. But we'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes. Well, I'm gonna keep moving ahead. I got a mother. I mean, pardon me, a mother. I got a wife who works in uh, uh, state government, so I've been blessed with that. She's been able to work it out. Why? Well, I have one. I have a question for you. Um, you, of course, came up with the concept for the cover of our World of Tomorrow's 25th anniversary book. Did you have a premonition <laughs> that because if anyone who's seen the cover, it's a bunch of people, um, space guys, getting out of their ship in like hazmat suits. Um, investigating w what's left of our publications that are in, uh, they find it's in some the uh, world. Sealed, sealed safe. Um, and and that, that book actually shipped right after everything shut down. Um, gee, did you know this was going to happen, John? <laughs> no, but I knew that Tom McWherty would do a great, great cover for us. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, no, you know, it was a Wally Wood kind of, kind of thought. And, uh, you know, we're going to be a treasure in the future. And, um, yeah, yeah. by early and by often, I say. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, CBC 23 with Wendy Peeney uh, is on press now. Should be shipping around mid-August. Um, we've had to adjust our release dates, but we hope to get things back on schedule. And we're crossing our fingers that Diamond, in light of DC kind of jumping ship on them, will stay in business and get everything to comic stores uh, and, and start paying their bills again on a regular basis soon. So um, I'm going to jump over to uh, Keith Dallas next. Keith. Wow. Uh, you've been with us. When did you first, I think you first wrote something maybe for Back Issue Magazine. Would that be your first? Uh, I had actually emailed you in 2006 pitching the Flash Companion. Uh, was our first uh, communication. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going on 14 years. Uh, as evidenced by my lack of facial hair, not as long as the other gentlemen uh, <laughs> that are participating. But, you know, maybe in another 10 I'll get as much facial hair as John Cook, but who can compare to John Cook? I mean, that's, you know, everyone's second fiddle to John Cook. Of course, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, we, uh, I guess I, I'm lucky in the sense that uh, with, with regards to American Comic Book Chronicles, we really didn't have anything prepared for 2020. Uh, the, the next volume that's going to be published is, um, uh, uh, Kurt Mitchell's uh, second uh, volume on the 1940s. Uh, he had to actually take a break for a few months because he was having some health issues, non-COVID-19 related, thank God. But you know he was having some some serious back issues, so he had to he had to take a break. So 
I guess in that sense, the, the, the pause that, you know, our nation's having sort of helped him out. Uh, but he's back at it now. Uh, he did an incredible job on, on the first volume. And I know he's, it's the second volume, I'm sure, is going to be uh, just as incredible. Um, after well, that, uh, go ahead. Yeah, clue, clue readers in on the actual evolution of that second half of the 40s book. How did it start versus Oh, wow. Yeah, that, so, geez, uh, how many, uh, how many lineup changes did we do on that? Um, cause originally we had Roy, uh, Roy Thomas on, on both volumes. He, um, he informed us, I forget how many years ago. But en enough time to, to for us to find a substitute, and he actually even recommended Kurt as his substitute for um, for the 1940s volumes. Uh, Kurt, after finishing the first 1940s volume, wanted to step away, you know, because as all American Comic Book Chronicles authors realize that this is each volume just breaks you. It just it just tears you down, <laughs> and it's so. I think, you know, the prospect of doing a second volume just wasn't appealing to him. So we had Bill Shelley uh, volunteering to tackle the second volume. And unfortunately, you know, Bill uh, passed away, but he had, he had um, completed a pretty detailed outline that Kurt has been able to. So once, you know, Bill passed away, we reapproached Kurt. I forget how many months it was between the publication of the first 1940s volume and when we reapproached Kurt, I want to say it was maybe like eight months, maybe six to eight months, something like that, but enough time for Kurt to sort of get his, uh, you know, refire his engines and, and be able to uh, be eager to tackle the, uh, the project. So he's working off of Bill's uh, detailed outline and we are hoping to uh, have that published by next year. You know, I, I think um, that's the that's the hope that it, this, this the volume will be done in time for it to be printed in 2021. Right. And we're hoping for spring 2021. Um, you know, when we printed our most recent promotional information, we definitely had it uh, a release date on it. And now with, you know, losing months because of the pandemic on our production schedule, everything's gotten kind of pushed back. But right. uh, but the other trick people need to realize is you don't just find some guy off the street and say, hey, do a book on 1945 to 49. Yeah. You've got to have somebody who really knows their stuff. And we have a very, we had a very limited number of, of candidates, you know, that, I mean, there were, there were a couple of people who approached me and you, I think that we both sort of agreed like, oh, you know, we're not going to name names, but you know, that we just felt, okay, you know, we're not really confident. Yeah. Just very, very li limited number of, I know I wouldn't be able to handle that test. I mean, that's, Th that's just a monumental task writing about the second half of the, of the 1940s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but so personally, uh, I know uh, your wife had yes. to go to Manhattan, to New York city at the height of the pandemic. Yep. Um, what did that do to you personally, to your personal life, to your family? Um, yeah, it was, it was surreal, you know, cause, uh, you know, my my wife and I were sort of camped out in a in a Airbnb on uh, and tell tell viewers what she does. Oh, so she's a nurse, and so she was um, contracted to at that point to um, go to the Bank of America's corporate office where in Times Square and uh, essentially be their uh, on call nurse. So when so she wasn't even really um, testing employees she was just you know if an employee wasn't feeling well she would you know take their temperature and and see if they were sick enough to send them home and she said she got a lot of sort of false alarms where I've, I've, as you can imagine a lot of people as soon as they start to feeling like a tickle in their throat they think they're they're coming down with it but so thankfully she she didn't uh you know come in direct contact with anyone uh who was infected but yeah, we, we spent a good three weeks in, you know, Midtown Manhattan uh, and it had a, a, a surreal end of the world type of feel, very much like the cover to, you know, uh, The World of Tomorrows, you know, just, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, Broadway being absolutely abandoned, you know, and I'm, I'm walking around 
uh, 42nd Street, um, and there's hardly a soul. I mean, just I could I was able to just sort of walk down the avenue with no cars at all, you know, and uh, and I took lots of pictures, and because I said this will never happen again in my life. Uh, let's hope this never happens again uh, in uh, in our lifetime. You know, so I think New York City now is starting to uh, resume. I know I think they're they're moving into like phase two, so people are returning to businesses. I think you can stores. I think are open, but you know, very limited number of people can uh, can go in. Things like that. So, but yeah, when when we went, everything was shut down with the exception of Seven Eleven and McDonald's. You know, so All right. We, we would go grocery shopping beforehand and just, you know, so we, we essentially were sequestered ourselves. So we, we felt, we felt completely safe, but you know. Yeah. Well, let me jump to Mike Manley now. Mike, you are uh, of, of us at Tomorrow's, you are the <laughs> one very actively working professional in the comics industry, not just in the, you know, comics books and magazines about comics industry and fanzine stuff, but, but you're working professional. You, you do comic books, comic strips, how has uh, the pandemic affected you and your work? And how does it going to affect your, your future plans for Draw Magazine? Well, um, back in January, <clears throat> when they first started talking about the thing in China, uh, I was very, actually very concerned because I kind of, my spider sense kind of told me this is probably where we were going. Um, I've read several things over the last couple of years from from uh, uh, from epidemiologists who were basically warning that something like this was going to happen and we weren't prepared. And I had had um, right after last Baltimore con, I had a problem. I had an infection in my leg, so I got home, went to my doctor. The doctor goes, "Go to emergency room right away." So two days after Baltimore, I'm in the hospital. I had to have. Um, operation on my left leg uh, they cut a big divot out of it and then they put a stent in on top of that so but while that was happening I was still drawing in my hospital bed right up until they wheeled me into surgery so <laughs> no stopping you <laughs> no no there's no stopping me but I actually because of that I had been teaching a comic book uh, an illustration class for 10 years at the Pennsylvania Academy which is for high school kids, any high school kid in Philadelphia can come and take this class for free. Some weeks, literally there'd be 50 kids in that room. So because of having the thing with my leg, I went back for a couple weeks, but then like we had spring break and right after spring break, I told Al Gurry, the guy who runs the department, don't, I don't think I can come back, you know, cause I have, uh, I have high blood pressure and I have type two diabetes, even though they're both well controlled, that puts you at a risk factor. So I stopped teaching my class and I probably will not go back teaching. And I've talked to several other people who are teachers, cartoonists who teach at SBA and places like that. It's a big thing for people that are doing that because there's a lot of people who are well over 50 or even over 60 or over 70 who teach comics, cartooning, and they're not gonna be able to go back. The strips are not affected in the way comic books are, but a lot of my friends, including, you know, Brett, who's my partner in crime on the, on the comic book book, he, he is finishing one project, but yet another project he was working for a claim, that's been, that's been stopped. And I know a lot of comic book artists who work for Marvel in DC have been either told to put their pencil down or things have been put on hold. So in a way, I'm fortunate because comic strips are not affected the way that comic books are. However, you know, newspapers are struggling. Uh, Cleveland Plains Dealer, I think, has gone down and a bunch of other things like that. So that affects people who buy strips who in turn can affect my job like all my editors at King Features everybody's working remotely now so nobody's in any offices anywhere so um, thankfully the strips are going strong comics you know I'm not I'm really I'm not so sure there's a lot of guys I know a lot of friends of mine 
who are, they don't know what the future is going to be for comics because, you know, the comic book business, direct market already had systemic problems that everybody has dealt with for decades. And then Diamond going, we don't know what Marvel's going to do, which is the other big shoe to drop, right? Um, and as far as draw, what I've done, what I did last year is I actually started doing a podcast, um, which is basically like draw, but, but as a podcast uh, with Brad and Jamar. And we initially just started doing it as a podcast, just all being audio, but we switched over now to being uh, live. So uh, we're doing it. So just like this, this is a Zoom meeting. We interview the artists in, in their in their studio, um, and that's been going great. We've done twenty five or something, I think. Since we're doing it twice a week since 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 the pandemic, since everybody's at home, right? So it's not like people are saying, "Well, I'm going to the mountains for two weeks" or something, you know. You know? Um, that's been doing really well, um, and uh, we now have a YouTube channel. So we have pencil to pencil .com where you can listen to it. Um, and now our, we have a YouTube channel and one, and you can go watch, you can watch them on Facebook, on our Facebook page, or you can watch them on our YouTube channel. Um, and what Mike, I would probably- Mike, have you uh, monetized that? Uh, well, to monetize YouTube, you need a hundred subscribers, right? And so I'm looking at this sort of all like paying it forward, just like with, with the magazine, you know? I think eventually it will be something that will return a revenue stream. Um, and it's a way of getting people to buy digital copies of the magazine. We've been plugging, you know, people to come and help John explaining what John just explained uh, at the beginning of this, uh, this video chat. Um, and then I think what I will probably do with draw my idea to do with draw, I already talked to John about this a little bit, is maybe go to doing, you know, once or twice a year, doing it sort of like an annual thing um, and doing the same thing, but maybe making it more of a, of a special issue a couple times a year, seeing where that goes, because I don't think uh, we're going to really know what's going to happen for until Marvel and image decides what they're going to do with the uh, distribution. So I think um, we're all sort of just waiting for the other shoe to drop. I think as an artist, you have to be like John, you have to be very proactive. You have to find what can I do? A lot of guys are thinking they're going to do Kickstarters, right? They're going to try to do find enough, or Patreon, things like that to get not one revenue stream, but multiple revenue streams. I think, everybody working is going to face the fact that maybe not one path is going to be the one that solves your your issue you might have to have a patreon you might have a youtube you might have to have something else so you can listen to the podcast on itunes uh stitcher um, um google plus um i think we're going to try to put it up on um spotify um but you know, that's just one, one part of it. And I see a lot of friends of mine are also sort of starting to think like, oh, maybe I might try a webtoon. Might I might try some of these other formats because a lot of people are not going to maybe be able to find work doing stuff for Marvel or DC, or you might do something for Image. But of course, if you can't get your book to the stores, and I know that my local store just opened, two weeks ago. But to be honest, most people I know are like, oh, I'll, I'll get there. I'll, <laughs> I'm not running right over to get my issue of Captain America today because I, I need it. So, um, well, that's, I think that's the big thing in the comics industry. The people are, the creators are very versatile and, and very creative in terms of how they find new and different ways to get their work out there. I know you have, obviously, with all you've got going on. And I, and I think people um, are understanding that things like Draw Magazine, the, you can't produce that on a regular schedule as much as you might want to because you have, like you say, you were teaching. You, you're, you're doing all these different uh, possible avenues just to, just to make a living with your creative abilities. 
and draw is just one facet of that. So people have been really patient, you know, waiting. Sometimes it's, it's months and months between issues of draw. Um, we don't have your next issue scheduled yet, but I know you have plans to, to, to do another issue. Right. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's kind of a, a take it, take it a day at a time thing, which is what we're all doing with the pandemic anyway. So, but uh, I always, I always say that it's also like, if you think about the guys in the fifties, when comics went down the tubes real quick, right? A lot of guys got out of comics. Some guys got into strips and some guys went into advertising and they never came back. So I kind of look at it as that time uh, it's, 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 it's comparable, except we have more choices like this, right? Which, you know, Jack Kirby couldn't do a podcast. <laughs> that would have been interesting if he could. <laughs> well, you know, the industry is very resilient. It's proven that time and time again since it started in what, the, the 30s. Um, yeah. And it's still here today. So I, I'm hope, uh, cautiously optimistic we'll still be around 10 and 20 years from now. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to our good pal, Eric Nolan Weathington now. Um, Eric, first Modern Masters volume. You've been working for us for, I guess, a couple of years prior to the first Modern Masters volume. Um, I know you, your, your first sort of professional work was scanning in a lot of the art for our, our 2001 book, Streetwise. Um, and then we said, well, let's do this Modern Masters series. You're perfect to handle this thing. You got third, well, 29 uh, volumes with a 30th one announced that still has not been published. Give give uh, give our, our viewers uh, an example of or, or or some idea of what you're doing in terms of modern masters. Uh, maybe that modern remasters thing that we mentioned. You might want to discuss that. And also, but what's been going on with you the last two three months as well? Oh uh, well, you know when the when the first started staying home, which was like the first couple, I guess my last day at the office was March 27th. So since I hadn't taken a vacation in about two years, uh, that, that was first two weeks, all I did was read comics uh, and you know, do some housework. So I, I, you know, I had like three short boxes of comics build up over the past few years and then another long box worth of trades that I hadn't read. So I was just, I was just catching up on comics and uh, kind of just relaxing for the first few weeks. And then it was just like, okay, I've got all these, you know, after working basically 60 hours a week for, about 12 years it's like you have all these projects around the house that don't get don't never have time to get done so that's why i started working on it for that oh well, uh, my yard work my, my 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 backyard looks immaculate now as opposed <laughs> to before this thing started and i i've got muscles i didn't have before this so <laughs> yeah i mean it's like my, the, the trees are starting encroaching in on my yard i think i'll get even a half and the trees are starting encroaching in the yard will be getting smaller and smaller so i'm trying to reclaim some of the yard um so that's yeah, you know, that's that's most of what I've been doing. What I did like the first month or so was just kind of decompress, read comics, do you know, do stuff around the house, uh, and just try to you know, um, just re recharge my energy, I guess. And uh, now I'm just trying to get back into things, just kind of slowly ramping things back up because it's you know after you're, after you kind of get loose used to a looser schedule where you don't have to get up at a certain time. Um, it's hard to get back on track. <laughs> do you find your days blend? Do you guys, uh, any of you guys, yes. your days kind of? I mean, the first, the first few days, like the first couple of weeks, I could, you know, that, but I, it was fine. But yeah, after that, they do kind of blend together. It's like, is this Saturday or Sunday? I don't remember. Um, yeah, that kind of thing. But, you know, I have to, there's, my wife's still working. She's a essential boy. She's a chemist. And, you know, they, uh, what she does is they, they, separate gases that are used in like microprocessors and transformers and all that. So she's been working. In fact, she's probably been, she's had a lot of double shifts, um, uh, the past few couple months. And so I've been having to, I've been, instead of doing half the cho half the house chores, I've been doing all the house housework and everything and taking care of the, all the, getting all the medications on time and all that stuff. So I've, I've had to keep track of the days to a certain degree. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it does, there is a, a semblance of, uh, everything blurring together after a while. Um, it, it kind of, there was a couple, a period right after my daughter was born when I was working from the home during the day and I would go into the newspaper back when I still worked in the newspaper, like, like three nights a week or four nights a week. But during the day, you know, I was, I could get up whenever I wanted and just, I was doing my freelance work during the day. 
so I've kind of fallen back into those routines where I go to bed way too late and get up a little, but I'm trying to, I you have to get up at a certain time because my cat's diabetic and needs her food and shot at a certain time. Of day. <laughs> well, I'm stressed at least, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get back in the swing of things uh, right. the past couple of weeks. And well, we had talked, actually Eric and I talked earlier today. Uh, the hope is that we can bring him back in for his regular employment in, uh, at tomorrow's uh, hopefully, you know, end of July, early August, something like that. If all the things still uh, shape up the way it looks, I'm op cautiously optimistic that they are shaping up that way, and we can get it back in for that. By the time the uh, the government, the government st stimulus that uh, Cookie there was uh, mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll, you know, by that by the time that's over with, I'll be back hopefully. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Be, and and know. not a moment too soon because I've been kind of running things sort of solo since the <laughs> end of March, and uh, it's. It's kind of hard to wear to wear three different hats. Uh, I, it's hard enough just doing my own, but then I, you know, I get to really appreciate all Eric does around here when he's not him. So, and so does my wife, and so do my daughters. Actually, I've been I've been working them to the bone too. So, <laughs> um, but in terms of your uh, modern masters and your future work, Eric. So, um, what, what, first of all, have you had a chance to get? Uh, you said uh, I think on the Jim Apero book, you've been getting a little bit of research done. Yeah, yeah, uh, I've been mostly doing because there's, uh, I've got, I mean. It's probably about 75% to 80% of the book is written now. Um, so now it's just like that. There's this period in the 70s where Apero just, he just did Brave and the Bold. So there's not a whole lot of interesting things to talk about per se, because it's just kind of a lot of the same. So I'm, I'm just going through trying to find interesting little things to talk about, to fill that chat, that section of the book. And um, so that's what I've been doing recently is just kind of, pouring through all the issues and the letters pages and everything, just to try to find some things. And we'll be interviewing Paul Levitz here pretty soon. Hopefully uh, I got to Jim Amish will be as my uh, co-editor on the book. And um, he's going to be doing the interview, but he doesn't have the recording equipment now. His is garbage. So I've got to take my equipment over there to him, which is about an hour away. And uh, now that the travel's a little more, we're a little more confident in traveling, I'll probably be able to do that soon, maybe next month. And um, so that can, that, that'll fill in about a bunch of information for the, for what I need. And hopefully the, at, once I have that interview, things will go along a lot quicker and uh, kind of finish this thing off. Can I ask you something, Eric? Can sure. I ask Eric something? So Eric, Eric and I have been manning the uh, tomorrow's booth at New York Comic Con for what, half a dozen years? I think past half a dozen years. What are the odds that we'll be doing that this year? Zero, I can tell you that because I've had to, uh, I've had to decline. Uh, they wanted us to go yeah, ahead yeah. and reserve our booth space, but they wouldn't guarantee us a refund if, like, New York had to shut down due to COVID. They all they would oh, say, really? yeah, all they would say was that, um, unlike Comic Con in San Diego, they say, oh yeah, actually, and they've already sent us our refund for this year. You know, that's fine, full refund. But New York, not so much. They uh, said basically, um, no, we no refunds but we will hold your booth spot for you and we'll just reschedule the show for later in the spring or something. And it's like, I have no idea if we would be able, they don't even know a rescheduled day. I have no idea yeah. if we would be able to attend then. So I had to basically just bow out. Um, I, I wish them the best. I hope New York does happen this year and it's a huge attendance because the industry can really use it right now. But also I, I, I think Eric may, a lot of you guys will mimic me on this. I'm not too keen about getting on a plane or uh, getting in a convention hall with 125,000 people. Well, that's the thing. I mean, think about how densely, I mean, can we, can we think of a more densely populated environment than a comic book convention? I'm thinking a Tokyo subway might be the only, <laughs> or Trump you know, rally. you know what, what John? Or a Trump rally. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Right. You know, well, so, I, I, yeah, I can tell you that none of the professionals I know, nobody's going to a show. And I know guys right. who were like three, four shows a month. Nobody wants to get on an airplane. Nobody wants to go to a convention. Because you know, you go to a convention, in five minutes, the men's bathroom looks like the monkey house. It's just <laughs> destroyed. <laughs> it's just destroyed. It's like water and whatever everywhere. Right. So it's like nobody wants to go and... And everybody's got their hand out. Hey, happy to meet you. Like, right. happy yeah. to meet you. you know? right. 
touching all the books at our booth with their grubby little fingers, right? And then I, and then we all have to pack them up and take them home. So. You're going to be right. over there with your wiping down your booth That's all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so Eric, um, back to you. Modern remasters. Yeah. Without going into too much detail, what, tell, tell people, so this, this whole talk isn't all gloom and doom. We are looking toward the future and some plans of things we can do coming down. That'd be really very exciting. Give, give uh, viewers a little idea of what that's all about. Well, I mean, the idea, I mean, we, even when I started Modern Masters, the idea was kind of like, you know, this is not a be all end all kind of book. This is like, this is your career up to this point because I wanted to get it before people things forgot things. Um, so my, my idea was like, basically like a lot of these guys, I just, after a certain amount of time, I'd go back and pick up where we left off and up to that point, you know, so it's kind of like doing that. Um, you know, we, just making it, uh, taking that old material, you know, maybe just trimming it some or whatever, and then adding all the new stuff and, and get it kind of getting a more full volume kind of thing. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, well, and also remastering the modern masters oh, yeah, into yeah. full color hardcovers yeah. uh, for some of the some of the the bigger names that we've covered up to date. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, what what's whatever's feasible, what we can think we can, you know, yeah, you can format with, you know, yeah. You know, Problem, so. Well, guys, I see by the clock on the wall, our time is almost up here, but I just want to say, does anybody have any uh, optimistic or hopeful last words that they would like to impart to our, to our viewership here? Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, history teaches us that things get dark, things get tough, people overcame it. Like I said, in the 50s, comic books pretty much looked like it was going to go away. And it didn't, and it came back and became bigger than ever. So I think that we might have to go sideways. We're going to have to be smart. We're going to have to work together and put our heads together. Um, and I think what worked before is not necessarily going to work in the future. But I can tell you that there are literally hundreds of young artists out there every week putting up new comic stories on places like Webtoons. So I think that this reality uh, might get difficult, but I think people are still going to always do comics. Yeah, and I think you, got, you need to remember that, you know, comics are a result of, uh, they were born in the Great Depression, you know, yeah. and it's all about, you know, that's where the superhero was born. And that's not, you know, superheroes aren't uh, encompass all of what comics is, but it's, it's, it is what the public recognizes as, you know, doing the next right thing and, uh, and that resilience, you know, I, I have, I mean, I go to the comic shop every week, I wear a mask, but uh, you know, they reopened about three weeks ago. Um, the amount, I don't know about this move by DC, whether that's, uh, you know, separating from diamond, whether that is foreboding or not, but. Uh, but we've seen that I've, before as well. And yeah. industry, industry survived when Marvel did it back in the, uh, what, the 90s, right? right? Yeah. The Heroes World? Yeah, the Heroes right. World debacle, right? Marvel, Marvel ruined it for everybody at that point. Now it's DC's turn, I guess. But we're yeah. still standing, <laughs> so. You know, and tomorrow's is standing because does the, the, the readership loves comics. I mean, and just Absolutely. loves the history of comics. And we started the market, John. I mean, you know, really in, in very many, you had the comic book marketplace, you had other magazines, but they were devoted towards the value of comics very much, as, as wonderful as comic book uh, marketplace was. But there's just, this is about the love of comics. And that's well, just not, that's not, a pandemic's not gonna take that away. Well, and I think Eric can probably speak very briefly <laughs> about the kind of responses he gets from people when they call on the phone to place an order when he's actually in here working or he's processing orders that come through the website and they put these nice little notes. And I've been seeing those for the last two months, my, myself personally, when I'm processing the orders that are coming in. So many of our readers are just stepping up to help us out right now. And so I don't want people thinking it's all like we're, we're going out of business. Right. Uh, we're gonna stay in business and it's, it's strictly because of our very long-term loyal readers that have stuck with us and the new ones that are picking up things like retro fan magazine, uh, brick journal, our Lego magazine that they're, they're, they're just, they love what we do because we love what we do and it shows and uh, people stick with us. So I, I got one more, one more thing to ask. I need to know what is the YouTube channel that you need subscribers for Mike? 
Can you tell us? And everybody it's pencil. This. If, if you if you type in pencil to pencil, pencil to pencil, pencil. To pencil you will find our uh, last couple episodes. And then once we get a hundred subscribers, then they actually, YouTube gives you an actual channel. You have to have enough people. It used to be you could just have a channel, but now they make it so that you have enough. And a subscription, to get a subscription is to, is to click a button. Right, right. you just sign up Everybody basically. Everybody watching yeah. this needs to Right, right, here. exactly, yeah. Hey, you got five it's, right here. We we're, we're, I'm gonna do it as soon as we hang up here, so. No, we do. No. But is it the numeral two? Yeah, no, T O. T O. Pencil. pencil two pencil. And I will put a I will put a blurb along the bottom, uh, some text on, on this thing in post production here before this actually airs for Comic Con at home. So, um, one last thing I wanted to clear up here: uh, we don't have uh, we have a lot of new magazines on our website listed for upcoming release, and those dates, as if things go well, are solid. Our only book releases for this year that we're proceeding with. One is called Holly Jolly, which is Mark Boger's new pop culture book about the history of Christmas pop culture. Uh, it's a, a delightful book, and I think exactly what people need in this kind of gloomy period. Um, it was originally going to come out in the summer, but it's now coming out in November. The other one is, um, it's called Old Gods Anew, which I stole from John B. Cook's uh, CBA number 10 cover blurb. Um, uh, it's a, a uh, a companion to Jack Kirby's Fourth World, and that's going to be the 80th issue of the Jack Kirby Collector. That was originally going to be coming out in the fall. It's now pushed back to January, but uh, John's a part of that book, um, and it's going to be, if you love Kirby's Fourth World, and if you want to know more about it, that's a great book. That that's was like old get, times, John. That was absolutely. Like but that's it for our book releases for this year. We will be having some announcements as things kind of solidify in the industry of what we're going to be producing definitely for 20 I, I definitely got books coming that, that we've been discussing. That we've Absolutely. We just got to make wait till things kind of stabilize a little bit. Yeah. So, but, um, so tomorrow's is not going anywhere. And with all you viewers continuing to help order from our website, subscribe, get our stuff at your local stores when they reopen, we're going to be around for another 25 years. So I just want to hey, thank our panelists guys. here. You guys, thank you. John Cook, Mike Manley, Eric Nolan, Wethington, Keith Dallas, you guys, you're the best to work with. And um, hey, thanks for tuning in, all, all you viewers out there.